What's up everybody, this is Leaf with Adaptable Wealth and in today's video we're going to continue our deep dives into the world of alternative investments with a look into farmland. Each day seems to bring increasing uncertainty and challenges for the storage and growth of our financial wealth. Central bank policy is resulting in reduced liquidity in financial markets around the world. Supply chain constraints and soaring inflation are wreaking havoc on corporate and household finances and the threat of world war is adding fuel to the fire. Given such uncertainty and the fact that most people are overexposed to stocks, bonds, and even real estate, investors are looking for the best place to store their financial wealth during these tumultuous times and often find themselves looking into alternative investments with the hopes that they can find something that consistently appreciates and beats inflation, produces a cash flow, diversifies your portfolio and protects during a downturn and is intrinsically valuable. So in today's video, we're going to dive into the benefits and risks of investing in farmland. And later on in the video, we'll cover some of the considerations for determining the right allocation for your portfolio. Ready? Let's kick it off. Let's start off with the reasons you'd want to own farmland. Farmland is unlike many other assets in that there are five ways to make money and lots of it provided you do your research. The first way to make money is through cash flow. This is the difference between money coming in from the property and money going out to operate, maintain, and pay the mortgage on the property. Think of it like a checking account. You have money coming in, you have money flowing out. But money comes in only if you rent the land out or you produce something on it that can then be sold and converted to cash. If the land sits idle, you only have money going out. In other words, you'll have a negative cash flow that you're going to have to cover out of your own pocket every month. I don't know about you, but I don't want to hold an investment that constantly requires that I take money out of my own pocket in order to hold it. I want that investment to pay me instead. Unfortunately, the current cash yield, which is the average rent as a percentage of the land value, sits at about 3% for cropland and a measly 0.9% for pasture land. This begs the question, why would you want to invest in farmland when the one-year treasury is yielding 4%? Keep this in mind as we explore all the risks and opportunities and allocation considerations that come with investing in farmland. Cash flow is good because it creates a baseline return on your investment and the money can be used for pretty much whatever you want. You can use it to help deal with the impact of inflation by using some of it to help pay for daily living expenses. You can invest it in other assets with the goal of building a well-diversified portfolio. But in my opinion, the best use of the funds is to use the cash flow from one property to finance the acquisition of a second property that is also positive cash flow. And stack cash flows like that across multiple properties and eventually you're going to develop a meaningful second income stream that will help you in your quest for financial freedom. Furthermore, rents tend to increase faster than inflation over time, further increasing your purchasing power over time. However, when dealing with farmland, it's important to distinguish between cropland and pasture land because the rates of return and the yields for each type of land can be quite different. Cropland rent growth has tended to outpace inflation by about 0.8% over the last 24 years, while pasture land rents have actually lost value to inflation over the same period. Lastly, you also have the option to share in some of the cash flow from the sale of the produce from the land in the form of crop sharing. This can absolutely increase your returns, but it's my opinion that newbies should probably stay away from such arrangements and leave it to those who know what they're doing. First, you're gonna to have to pay for some of the operating expenses such as energy, seeds, fertilizer, water, machinery, and so on. And second, the inflation adjusted prices of the major crops and livestock have actually trended down over the past 30 to 50 years. In fact, only oats have kept up with inflation while cotton has trailed inflation by a whopping 2.3% per year. In my opinion, crop sharing just introduces more risk for what seems to be a rather small increase in potential returns. If the inflation adjusted prices of the produce you're selling are constantly decreasing, then the pressure is going to be on to constantly increase the productivity of your operations, or you're going to watch your returns decrease over time. Because of this, it's my opinion that you're probably better off just owning the land and renting it out at market rates rather than getting involved in crop sharing if you're new to the farmland game. The next source of farmland returns is through equity. Equity is simply the difference between the price you can sell your property for and what you still owe on it. Whereas cash flow is considered your checking account, think of equity as your savings account. Just like with real estate, you have three components of equity, market-based price appreciation, forced price appreciation, and loan pay down. Market-based price appreciation is a significant driver of financial wealth because you can get so much leverage with a mortgage. This chart shows what is called the leverage multiple. 
Depending on what percentage you put down, you can get a disproportionate increase in your return on investment. With a 1% increase in price, you can get a 5%, 10%, 20%, or 28.6% return on your investment. This is why land and real estate has played such a large role in the building of so many fortunes. You're dealing with large dollar amounts and you can get a ton of leverage to amplify your returns. Based off the USDA's farmland value since 1987, you're looking at about a 4-6% to nominal return regardless of region. The thing that differentiates the top performing markets from the lower performing markets are the higher price variability and the larger magnitude of decreases in land values during down years in the lower performing markets. Compare these returns to the 9% return of the S&P 500 over the same period and you'll see why I say stocks are hard to beat and are probably the best wealth builder for the average person. The second driver of equity is forced price appreciation. This is where you make improvements to the land and watch the price and rental value of the land increase by more than the cost of improvements. Examples include soil improvement, improving access to the land, improving drainage, adding a backup water source, and more. The loan pay down is the last way to build wealth through equity, and you have two options. Either you pay down the mortgage or you rent the land out and your tenant pays the mortgage down for you, but you reap the benefits of increasing equity. Which one sounds better to you? This is why farmland leasing makes so much sense. Provided you don't default on the loan, you'll benefit from this regardless of what happens to the price of the property. The next source of returns comes in the form of tax benefits. First, always consult a tax professional. I'm just a dude on the internet giving information and education, not financial advice. There are three benefits afforded farmland. The first is the fact that you can deduct any expense required to obtain the loan and or operate the property. You can immediately write off things like routine maintenance and repairs, supplies, labor, etc. But you'll have to depreciate the big ticket items like machinery, equipment, or the addition of a building to the farm. These are considered capital expenditures and must be depreciated over time, which takes us to the second tax benefit of farmland, depreciation. The IRS allows you to treat the purchase of capital goods used in the operation of a farm as investments that lose value over time. It's very important to note that the farm must be considered as in service and actually producing something before you can claim a depreciation deduction and you can only depreciate the capital goods such as equipment and buildings, you cannot depreciate land. Unlike residential real estate where you must depreciate capital expenditures over a 27 and a half year period, capital expenses for the purpose of farming can often be depreciated at much quicker rates ranging from 5 to 20 years depending on what is being depreciated. You benefit from depreciation because it's a non-cash expense that lowers your taxable income and shelters some of your cash flow from taxes. For example, if the building portion of the property you bought is assessed at $250,000 and assuming you can depreciate it over a 20 year period, you can write off $12,500 per year. So if you receive $25,000 a year in rental income and that costs you $10,000 in operating expenses, most people think that you have to pay taxes on the remaining 15%. This is not true. You have to pay taxes on the remaining $2,500 after your depreciation deduction. So you get the tax benefits up front, but the IRS doesn't just give money away. You'll have to pay a portion of that back once you sell up to a maximum of 25% of the depreciation claimed. For example, let's say you held the property for 10 years and end up with a cumulative depreciation claim of $125,000. When you go to sell the property, you will then have to pay taxes at your current income tax rate or 25%, whichever is lower. At 25%, that would be $31,000. However, there are three ways to avoid this depreciation recapture. You have the 1031 exchange, you could die, or you can sell at a loss to your adjusted basis. The last two options are not desirable, so that really only leaves the 1031 exchange. We're not gonna go into what a 1031 exchange is in this video, but I strongly suggest that you understand it if you want to invest in farmland. The third tax break you receive as owner or investor in a farm are lower property tax rates. Every single state offers lower property tax rates for farmland versus residential real estate. The average reduction is about 0.56%, with the largest reductions being in Illinois, New Jersey, Texas, Wisconsin, and Iowa, and the lowest reduction being Maine, Alabama, South Carolina, Nevada, and California. On a $300,000 property, that's a savings of approximately $1,700 per year. 
Now, unlike residential real estate, farmland investments come with the additional money-making opportunity of subsidies from the federal and in some case state governments. There are four primary forms of subsidies. The first two apply only if you're going to be planting crops on the land. If you're just renting the land out, then only the third and fourth are available to you. First, we have commodity subsidies. These are a series of government programs designed to ensure that farmers receive a certain price level or level of revenue for their operations. For example, if the government declares that a bushel of wheat should be $3 and the market price drops to $2, then the government will pay a $1 per bushel subsidy to ensure that farmers receive that $3 per bushel rate. The second type of farm subsidy is crop insurance. The USDA pays for farmers when their crop yields or revenues decline due to things such as drought, excessive rain, a freeze, excessive heat, decline in price, and more. Just like any other insurance, farmers have to pay a premium, but there's a huge benefit here. The premiums are highly subsidized to the point that farmers only pay approximately 40% of the true total premium. The third type of farm subsidy are conservation subsidies. Here, the USDA pays an annual rent payment in exchange for farmers removing environmentally sensitive land from agricultural production and planting species that will improve environmental quality. The fourth type of farm subsidy is disaster relief, where the government reimburses farmers for the loss of production or income due to natural disasters. So those are the primary ways to make money with farmland, but that's not the only benefit of investing in farmland. I frequently hear that farmland is a good inflation hedge. But, is that true? When determining whether an asset protects against inflation, you first have to consider its ability to maintain your purchasing power over the long term, and second, how it does during short-term spikes in inflation. Over long periods of time, talking 50, 75, 100 plus years, farmland beats inflation by 1% per year over the past 110 years. This may not sound like much, but it's enough to have tripled your ability to afford goods and services over that period. Please note that this is on a national level and combines cropland with pasture land because we don't have the data that splits between the two land types going back farther than 1997. Since 97, though, you'll see that both have done very well versus inflation with cropland outperforming pasture land by about 0.5% per year over the past 25 years. During short-term spikes in inflation, the results are more mixed. I define an inflation spike as a CPI value of 5% or more. Since 1910, there have been six such periods, and farmland has beaten inflation in half of those periods and overperformed by an average of 2.9%. However, it has underperformed in the other half of those periods on average by 4.1%. Having said that, just like residential real estate, most of the underperformance versus inflation occurred in the earlier part of the century. Its inflation beating track record is overwhelmingly positive since the 1940s. I also looked at the 10-year compound annual growth rates of farmland values versus the CPI. Of the 29 rolling 10-year periods with an average annual CPI of 5% or higher, national farm prices trailed the CPI 38% of the time and they trailed on average by 3.2%. On the other hand, they beat CPI 62% of the time and beat it by an average of 3.7%. To sum all this up, farmland values tend to hold up against short-term spikes in inflation, but over periods of 10 years or more where the CPI runs at an average annual rate of 5% or higher, farmland values handily outperform inflation on average by 1% per year. Additionally, this analysis only focuses on price movements. If you factor in the other sources of return, farmland handily beats inflation over 10-year periods or longer. The third reason you'd want to invest in farmland is for diversification. In order to evaluate the ability of farmland to effectively diversify your portfolio, I focus on four things. One, is it highly correlated with traditional assets? Two, does it reduce the risk return profile of a portfolio? Three, how does it hold up during recessions, corrections, or stock bear markets? And lastly, can you hold the asset outside of the traditional financial system? First, the correlation of annual farmland returns to those of traditional assets is very low since 1910. In fact, it's negatively correlated to stocks and bonds. And not only is this the case at the national level, we see the same across all the geographical regions as well. Please note that these geographical correlations that you're seeing 
are as of 1987, not 1910, because that's as far back as the data goes at the geographical level. It's great to see the low and inverse correlations of annual returns, but the farmland market moves much, much slower than traditional asset markets, which means that annual returns may not be the best time frame to view correlations. Because of this, I took a look at the correlations of the five-year and 10-year rolling returns and found pretty much the same thing, but a bifurcation between assets started to appear. The correlation of farmland with stocks, bonds, and even residential real estate remained about the same, but an unexpectedly large correlation between farmland and gold and silver popped up at the five-year period and got even higher at the 10-year period. And not only is this the case at the national level, it holds for most geographical regions as well, with the Southern Plains, the Pacific, and the Corn Belt being very, very highly correlated to gold and silver. All in all, this shows that there are sufficiently low correlations between all farmland regions and stocks, bonds, and even residential real estate that it satisfies the objective of low correlation for most people. I say for most people because the large majority of people do not hold significant quantities of gold or silver. They hold stocks and bonds and many hold real estate. Of course, if you do hold real estate, it likely makes up a large percentage of your net worth, so you should be aware of the fairly high correlation with farmland. But for those who hold primarily stocks and bonds, farmland appears to be a great non-correlated and in many cases inversely correlated asset to add to your portfolio. The next factor to consider when looking at diversification is the risk reward profile and whether or not your expected returns per unit of risk will decrease when you add farmland to your portfolio. At the national level, it's obvious that farmland will improve the risk return profile of your portfolio. Farmland blows stocks, bonds, residential real estate, gold, and silver out of the water. The average return per unit of risk is higher, farmland has a lower frequency of down years, and it loses less during its down years compared to these other assets. Although its biggest up year return is lower than many of these other assets, it's about the same as residential real estate and it dropped only 4% during the GFC, which is much, much better than the 25 to 40% drops in these other assets over the same period. The same holds true at the regional level. You have the best markets in terms of risk reward where every region blows stocks, bonds, residential real estate, and precious metals out of the water. Then you have the worst performing regions. Even these returns compare favorably to these more traditional assets. Only the mountain and southeast regions fail to beat the risk-adjusted return of all these other assets. Having said that, these two markets still offer a better risk-reward proposition than stocks, gold, and silver due entirely to their lower price variability. Remember though, this only factors in price returns. It ignores cash flow, loan paydown, tax benefits, and subsidy benefits. Once you factor those in, the total return will be a percentage point or two higher than what is shown in these grids. Because of this, I'd say that farmland absolutely satisfies the second objective of not reducing the risk return profile when added to a traditional portfolio. The next question is, how does it hold up during recessions, corrections, and bear markets? I went back and looked at the behavior of farmland during stock market corrections and full-on bear markets since 1910. I define a correction as a drop in stocks of 10 to 20% while I define a bear market as a drop in stocks of more than 20% or a multi-year drop. As you can see in this chart, farmland holds up very well during both corrections and bear markets, even better than residential real estate. During corrections, farmland increases 11% on average and has never dropped during a correction lasting one year or less. In other words, when stocks drop 10 to 20%, farmland at the national level is up 100% of the time since 1910 and returns on average 11%. During bear markets, farmland has dropped a couple of times, but for the most part, it's up. When farmland values do drop, they drop an average of 21%, while stocks drop 35%. This is a bit misleading though. Out of the eight stock bear markets since 1910, farmland values have dropped only twice, and one of which occurred during the Great Depression where it dropped by 39%. The other time it dropped was in the 1940s and it only dropped 3% while stocks dropped 34%. In the six other stock bear markets, farmland values were up an average of 13% while stocks dropped an average of 32%. The combination of low historical correlations, a superior risk return profile, and the fact that farmland has historically held up very well during stock market corrections and bear markets 
leads to my conclusion that farmland indeed acts as a powerful portfolio diversifier. Another fact that supports this conclusion is that out of the 16 times that stocks have dropped 10% or more since 1910, farmland has never dropped more than stocks. However, there have been many instances of farmland decreasing at a time where stocks are increasing. Again, pointing to the low and sometimes inverse correlation between farmland and stocks since 1910. The final consideration on the topic of diversification is, can you hold the asset outside of the traditional financial system? As censorship of opinions that differ from the official narrative increase and the state increasingly targets its own citizens, it's becoming more and more important that we hold assets that can't be traced directly back to us or are highly resistant to seizure. Unfortunately, farmland fails miserably in this area. Being a large physical asset that requires you tie it back to yourself for the purpose of establishing ownership, it exposes you to the possibility that a claim or judgment by the state be placed on the property and there would be little you could do to keep the state from taking the property. For the same reason, it's pretty much impossible to discreetly pass farmland onto your heirs so that they don't have to pay taxes. Compare that to bearer assets such as gold, bitcoin, and cash, where all you have to do to pass it on to your heirs is walk up to them and give it to them. They keep 100% of the value because no taxes are due, because nobody besides you and them know about it. The fourth and final reason you'd want to invest in farmland is because it has massive amounts of intrinsic value. I'm talking about true intrinsic value, not what I consider to be the fake intrinsic value of precious metals, diamonds, watches, and jewelry. In my opinion, intrinsic value exists on a spectrum ranging from being able to help you survive, to doing work for you, to producing a cash flow, all the way down to being the embodiment of the energy used to produce it, which is pretty much everything. Farmland has several aspects of intrinsic value, with the most important being the fact that you can build a property on it which can be used to shelter yourself from the environment around you, and you can use the land to produce food and other materials needed for survival. This is one of the qualities of farmland that really sets it apart from other investments. No other investment can give you one of the inputs specifically designed to feed yourself and your family in the case of a food shortage. It can also produce a cash flow, and it can be the embodiment of nature's microbiome that can be integrated with the natural environment around it. Because of these very valuable aspects of true intrinsic value, there will always be a demand for farmland, provided U.S. citizens don't agree to start eating bugs and lab-created food. There aren't many assets that can guarantee a demand for it, regardless of the scenario. Now that we know about the benefits and the reasons why you'd want to look into farmland as an alternative investment to stocks, bonds, and other traditional assets, let's dig into the risks and drawbacks of investing in farmland. Before we get into the risks of farmland investing, please like this video and subscribe to this channel. These deep dives take a lot of time and subscribing and liking is the easiest way you can help me grow this channel if you find this content valuable. First of all, let's get one thing straight. There is no risk-free asset as many like to claim for U.S. Treasuries. To improve the probability of a profitable investment, it's vital that you understand all the risks associated with an investment and take steps to reduce those risks. Some risks you face investing in farmland include location risk. Just like residential and commercial real estate, location is a huge factor when it comes to farmland. The USDA breaks the U.S. into 12 regions, each of which have different soil types and qualities, weather, government regulations, and more. For example, the western regions are going to be more susceptible to drought, where the eastern regions are going to be more susceptible to flooding and freezing. Because of this, each region will have different supply-demand dynamics and, as a result, different risk-return profiles. Let's circle back to the risk return tables. You have regions like the Delta states, Lake states, and the Pacific, which have historically offered steady, stable returns with less price variability than regions like the Southeast or mountain regions, which have shown higher price variability and risk of large price drops. Another risk you'll have to deal with is illiquidity. Just like any land or real estate investment, it takes quite a while to buy and sell. It can take two, three months minimum, and quite often more than a year for farmland, due to its unique characteristics of each plot of land. Because many farm operations require highly specific qualities such as weather, soil quality, topography for drainage, and more to produce the crop or livestock, finding a buyer can be a tedious task should you want to exit your investment. 
It is now possible to buy a portion of farmland via crowdfunding sites like AcreTrader, FarmFunder, and FarmFolio, but almost all of these funds require a 5-10 to 10 year holding period, and very few offer a secondary market to sell into. And if they do, you're restricted to selling into that one platform, which significantly reduces the number of buyers you have to sell to. A result of this illiquidity is that it becomes more difficult to value prior to putting it on the market to see what the bids are. The tracking and reporting infrastructure around residential and commercial real estate is well defined, which affords us easy access to reliable and consistent data sets with which to compare and value properties. There is a ton of data out there from the USDA and other farm related organizations that can help you get a good idea of an aggregated average value per acre of farmland. The problem is, each farm's unique productive capacity characteristics such as the soil's moisture retention, micronutrients, the climate, and historical production capacities significantly influence the true underlying value of the land. These variables often go untracked and unreported and therefore not fully considered in the valuation of a plot of farmland until a potential buyer assesses your land or you pay for an assessment yourself. Next, we have large upfront costs. Although there are many loan programs like through the FSA that don't require you put more than 5% down, closing costs average around 3%, which means you're looking at about 8% of the purchase price out of pocket in order to buy farmland. Assuming a $200,000 to $300,000 purchase price, that's about eight dollars to $16,000 out of pocket. That's cheaper than the upfront costs required to get into residential or commercial properties, but most ordinary people don't have eight dollars to $16,000 laying around for the purchase of farmland. Next, we have vacancies. This is pretty much a certainty in land and real estate investing. No matter what you do, it's pretty much guaranteed that you'll have a period of time where nobody is renting your land. This leaves you on the hook for the mortgage payments over that time. And because this means lost revenue for you, it is vital to account for vacancy in any calculations you make when considering an investment in farmland. Talk to a real estate agent or property manager in the area that you plan to invest in order to get an estimate of vacancy rates in that area. And make sure that they are experienced in dealing with farmland. The best way to minimize vacancy is to charge a competitive rent, have a good tenant screening process in place, know the amenities that farmers in the area desire, keep the property, soil, buildings, etc. in good shape, develop and maintain a network of potential agents, renters, and property managers, and advertise. The next risk you'll face is operational risk. The demand for rentable farmland is directly influenced by the profitability of the farmers looking to rent your land. As profitability falls, which it has on an inflation-adjusted basis for decades now due to rising input costs and falling crop and livestock prices, either the farmer has to find more and more ways to increase the productivity of their operations and or the government needs to increase subsidies. Either way, there is a risk that one or both of those avenues get reduced over time, which will reduce the number of farmers looking to rent land. The next risk is interest rate risk. Higher interest rates increase the cost of acquiring farmland. The landowner will either have to charge a higher rent in order to maintain the same level of cash flow, or they'll have to agree to receive a lower return on investment. Higher borrowing costs also increase the cost of operating a farm, especially for operations that require heavy machinery or other inputs that rely on debt because of the high costs. This takes us back to the operational risk that we just discussed. Borrowing costs are a cost of doing business, and if costs go up, then the farmer has to find more and more ways to be more productive or get more subsidies to stay at the same level of profitability. If they are unable to do so, you will see a reduction in demand for rentable farmland over time. Additionally, when borrowing costs are low, it's profitable to borrow against your existing holdings in order to finance additional acquisitions. But once interest rates increase, that becomes less feasible, putting downward pressure on land values as the demand for credit decreases. Higher interest rates also affect the risk return considerations for other investments. If you can get an acceptable interest rate for just parking your cash in a CD or a treasury, many people are going to choose that avenue rather than dealing with the hassles of investing in farmland. Then there is bad weather, which is obvious but has to be stated. Damage to crops and or farmland due to drought, floods, heat, freezing temperature, and disease can not only cost the farmer his crops, it can reduce farmland values and rents. The best example of this is the Dust Bowl between 1934 and 1940, where agricultural land values substantially and persistently fell. 
Now this is a once in a lifetime event, but excessive heat, freezing temperatures, and disease decimate crops every year. Next, we have legal risks. It's common knowledge that Monsanto, now a part of Bayer, commonly sues farmers if any genetic material, which can be carried to adjacent farms through the wind or pollinating insects, is found on the crops of another unlicensed farm. Other legal risks, such as salmonella or other disease outbreak in and around your farm could require that all crops be destroyed and possibly the farms be put out of service until the problem has been taken care of. The primary way to reduce legal liability is to hold the property in an LLC or some other legal entity that is separate from yourself. This way, only the assets held within the legal entity are at risk and not your personal assets such as your IRA, savings, etc. Of course, I'm just a dude on the internet. I'm not an attorney and all legal issues should be discussed with a qualified legal professional. The next risk you face is political risk or government policies. Tax laws, regulations for chemical use, tariffs, and subsidies are all examples of government decisions that can have a major impact on the farm business. Many studies have concluded that government subsidies and tariffs are baked into the price of the land and to a lesser extent the rents. So, tariffs on U.S. agricultural exports or undesirable changes to farm subsidy programs could reduce farmland rents and land values across the nation. Next, we have the risk of default or foreclosure. There is a real possibility that one or more of the risks that I already outlined in this video put you in a position where you have to cover some or all of a mortgage. And if you're unable to do so, it could result in the bank foreclosing on your property. To guard against this, you should have a larger cash reserve than you otherwise would have. If you normally hold three to four months of living expenses in cash, you should probably bump that up to a minimum of six months. Next, we have significant food surpluses. We've already demonstrated that farmland values are incredibly resilient, not only during inflationary periods, but during economic downturns as well. But the one thing that really seems to beat down farmland values, other than a Great Depression or a crazy weather event like the uh, Dust Bowl, are surpluses in agricultural output. And there are two periods in particular. The first was during the roaring 1920s, where farm prices dropped due to huge agricultural surpluses, causing agricultural commodity prices and land values to drop steadily. From 1921 to 1928, farmland values dropped by 29%, while the economy boomed and the stock market returned 202%. The other instance came in the mid-1980s when it dropped by 27% from 83 to 87, while the stock market increased by 76%. According to the USDA, the decrease in farmland values was due to surpluses, a slowing in inflation, and a general decline in the demand for agricultural land. The final risk to any investment, and it certainly applies to farmland as well, is one you directly control, poor due diligence. Unless you have significant experience investing in farmland, I strongly suggest that you learn, learn, and learn some more before making your first purchase. In fact, you should probably never stop learning because like residential real estate, farmland is a very localized investment. The county where your farm is located could enact new restrictions such as harsher operational standards, rent controls, and more. All of these could derail your expected returns from an investment in farmland, so staying on top of such developments could mean the difference between generating the returns that you expected when you made the initial investment to generating no returns and even a loss. That wraps up the section on the risks of farmland investing. The final consideration for our analysis of an investment in farmland is what allocation percentage is right. Here comes the cop out. I can't say what's right for you because I'm not you. I don't know your financial situation. I don't know your required rate of return to meet your financial goals, nor do I know anything about your ability or willingness to take on risk. This is a decision you'll have to make for yourself. But like I said, I think 10 to 20% is appropriate for most people, especially for farmland given its long track record of strong inflation adjusted returns and true intrinsic value. Having said that, buying physical farmland presents one major challenge when it comes to deciding on an allocation percentage. Because land can be quite expensive, a single investment property immediately becomes a very large portion of your portfolio. For example, if you have 50k in assets and you buy a $250,000 plot of farmland, it immediately becomes 83% of your portfolio. With 100k in assets, it be it's gonna still going to be 75%. With 500k in assets, it'll still be 33%. 
you'd have to have 1.25 to 2.5 million dollars in order to meet that 10 to 20 percent range. Before I get into the ways around this allocation issue, I must state that none of this is investment advice or recommendations about which platforms, REITs, or stocks to invest in. I currently have no affiliation or interest in any aspect of the companies or investments I'm about to name. I'm just throwing these out there as an idea so you can start your investigation into what method of farmland investing is best for you. There are a few ways around the allocation dilemma, and the first is through crowdfunded investment platforms. Just like anything in life, there are pros and cons to buying farmland through shared investment platforms. The pros are that they allow for a much more passive approach because the fund is going to handle the farm vetting process, the collection of rents and crop cash flow, and they'll handle any paperwork, tax filings, and shareholder distributions. Additionally, you can invest in little as $5,000 most are going to require ten to twenty thousand dollars which is still quite low compared to the hundred thousand dollars usually required to buy your own plot of farmland lastly many platforms offer both debt and equity investments in farmland across the nation the cons include tons of extra fees minimum hold periods of five to ten years some platforms will allow an early exit uh, but you're going to be dealing with some very stiff penalties for doing that and there's rarely a secondary market to share uh, to sell your shares into, meaning you should expect to hold your investment for the duration of the agreement. Then there's the fact that you're typically buying shares of an LLC that holds the farmland, which means you don't actually own any part of the farm. Instead, you own a claim to the cash flow and price appreciation recognized by the investment. It's not like you can go get a title for your portion of the land you invested in. Lastly, most platforms such as AcreTrader, FarmFunder, and FarmTogether are open only to accredited investors. The sites that offer investment to non-accredited investors include Harvest Returns, Steward, and Farmfolio. Better yet, Steward offers some investments with an initial investment as low as 100 bucks. The second way to control the allocation of farmland in your portfolio while still getting exposure to this asset is through publicly traded farmland REITs. REIT stands for Real Estate Investment Trust. You're investing in the shares of a publicly traded firm that buys the physical farmland and manages it for all of the shareholders. You benefit by changes uh, in the price of the shares and through distributions. The good news is that many REITs offer significantly higher dividend yields than the common stock because they get tax benefits for paying out at least 90% of their taxable income. I prefer to invest in REITs for three reasons. First, the options are much greater than with crowdfunding platforms, which means the potential for greater diversification. They can hold just land, they can rent the land to a farmer, they can participate in crop sharing, and they can invest in more than just farmland. In fact, there are many REITs that invest in water rights and other properties that support farming, such as cooling facilities, processing plants, packaging facilities, and distribution centers. Also, most REITs own several different properties across the nation, which can help diversify your exposure to specific land types, locations, crop types, and more. Just make sure you understand what each REIT holds so you understand your risks and your diversification or lack thereof. The second reason I prefer REITs is that they trade like stocks, so the liquidity is much, much higher than with crowdfunding platforms, which can require you to stay in the investment for several years or pay a hefty fee to get out. And the good news is that the correlations to stocks of the top two farmland REITs is much lower than I thought they'd be, ranging from about 0.4 to 0.6, with the highest correlation being with the S&P 500, but this is still considered a fairly low correlation. The third reason I prefer REITs is you can hold REITs in a tax-sheltered account such as an IRA, or even better, a Roth IRA with no additional fees. This way you can defer or even avoid paying taxes on any of the price gains or distributions. Of course, you can hold physical farmland in an IRA, but there's so many hoops to jump through that it increases the cost of investing in the asset, which necessarily reduces your returns. There are a few drawbacks to REITs though. The first is that they are funds. So you can lose money by other investors selling their shares even if the value of the underlying asset stays the same. This is less of a possibility with crowdfunded sites where you buy a portion of the actual asset. Another drawback is that some farmland REITs are not publicly traded. They can have minimum hold periods, usually of five years, and they can have minimum investment amounts. So make sure you do your due diligence and fully understand what you're buying. Finally, you don't legally own the farms that you're invested in. Depending on your goals and your desire for liquidity, it's up to you to decide 
which method of farmland vesting is right for you, whether it's holding the physical farmland that you own personally or purchasing shares through crowdfunded platforms or farmland REITs. Well, that's all we have for our deep dive into farmland. If you have any questions, ideas for my next video, or if you'd like me to dig further into any of the topics that we discussed in this video, please leave a comment below. Also, please like this video and subscribe to the channel. These deep dives take a lot of time and liking and subscribing is the easiest thing you can do to help me grow this channel if you find this content valuable. Until next time, you all take care and remember, wealth is not only about money and things. Your time and health are just as important and working to improve all three pillars of wealth is key to being adaptable, resilient, and thriving in life.